This is the hoary bat, another descriptive uh, bat. This is the biggest bat that you have in, in uh, Minnesota and for most of North America, except for the, the Southwest there. It's pretty hefty. When you get a hoary bat in your hand, it's, you know, after holding some of the other ones, you, you're a little bit more uh, careful and a little bit more aware of the size of it. Um, it's got this distinct silvering frosting all around it, and that's what the hoary is. It's got a distinct yellow face, and this is another migratory, migratory bat, like the red bat and the silver haired. But they're pretty big, and we've caught quite a few of them in, uh, in Aiken County and out here on these projects out here. So they're, they're fairly common. Uh, they fly, since they're so big, they're not really flying through the woods like all the other bats. They're, they're kind of higher flyers, you know, high, flying above the tree canopy and then just kind of dipping in where, where they, you know, detect, uh, detect some good insects. So. This is the northern long-eared bat. This is the one that a lot of the hubbub is around for around here. It's personally one of my favorite bats. It's, it's super cute, and it's really easy to deal with. They've got uh, these long ears, but they're not, they're not huge ears, but they're, they're longer than a lot of the other bat species. Um, they're fairly common, but they're dying off in the northeast, and, and with that fungus moving west, it's uh, prompted the fish and wildlife to propose listing them for endangered species. Um, they're, they're pretty small bats, you know, you, they, they sit in your hand, they're, they're about that big body size, and, you know, wing size are about like that. Um, they're really cute, and they're pretty docile, too, when you get them in your hand. They're not, they're not over aggressive, or, you know, most of these bats, I, I would guarantee that pretty much all the bats I've, I've handled, that's the first time they've ever encountered a human, and it's probably very frightening for them, and they bite you really hard to try to get away. Um, but these guys are pretty, pretty relaxed. Um, when we're out there, some of these bats obviously look a lot alike, the brown ones especially. And so we have these suite of characteristics that we look for and try to identify them with. Long-eared bats, you know, since that's a target species for a lot of our surveys, uh, we have to be permitted to, to ID these. And so that means we have to have a lot of experience handling these bats and knowing their different characteristics and how they differentiate from other bats. Um, one of the main things is this little Right there, you see that? That's called the tragus. It's a little flap of skin. And northern long-eared bats have a really sharp kind of spear-like tragus. And that's, uh, that's a good characteristic to differentiate it from this bat here, which looks very similar, right? It almost looks exactly the same. It still has kind of long ears. It's, you know, it's kind of a relative term. They look a little bit longer when you're holding them next to a little brown. But you know, comparing that picture to that, there's not much difference there. So when we do that, we look at that tragus right here. And this one's a lot shorter and a lot blunter than that spear-like one. So it's characteristics like that and looking at the toe hairs, stuff like that. These guys, little brown bats, have really long, shaggy toes. And so if the toe hairs extend beyond the claw then, and the, the tragus is short, then we know it's a little brown and versus a northern long-eared bat. Um, in the rest of the Midwest, we have a, another endangered species called the Indiana bat that doesn't come up here. But uh, those three bats, the Indiana Little Brown and Northern Long-Eared Bat, are all very, very closely related and very, they act the same, they have kind of the same ecology, and uh, they look a lot alike. So it takes years of experience and handling hundreds, if not thousands, of bats to, to get that experience to be able to you know, work with them, basically. So that's the species of bats that you guys have in, in Aiken County and in Minnesota. Um, what I was going to cover next was kind of just the life cycle of a bat, basically the yearly, yearly to-do list for bats. Uh, I'm going to start in the fall because that's kind of, you know, after this season and it's when it kind of basically starts the whole process. So after August 15th, it's considered the fall for bats. And what we mean by that is that between August 15th and November, and it's a, it's a relative date, they can, you know, it's not a set date that they're like, all right, it's November, I got to get get to my next hibernaculum, you know. So they, it's October, September, depending on the weather, depending on the climate, it kind of dictates when they, when they go and hibernate. Uh, but what they do is they, they leave their summer grounds and they start heading towards where they're gonna hibernate for the, for the winter. And when the females get there, they're greeted by a horde of males that have been waiting for them for probably a month or so. Um, and then they swarm around the entrance of the of the cave or mine or wherever they're gonna wherever they're gonna hibernate for the winter, and that's where mating takes place. Um, 
after that takes place, the females move into the hibernaculum. And when I'm saying hibernaculum, that's just the, the hibernating site. So you'll, you'll see it up here and hear me say that a bunch, but that's what it means. The females move into the hibernaculum, ready to, ready to turn off and go to sleep for the, for the winter. The males will stick around, do that for a couple more weeks, and you know, just try to, try to get as much out there as they can. Um, the last roost tree you know, to swarming site is around 20 miles away. So basically, before they move in, they're kind of migrating from their summer habitat. So say we caught a bat outside here, you know, they're going to move towards the nearest hibernaculum, which can be, you know, 60 miles away or something. But along there, they're going to stop. And then, you know, about 20 miles within, that, that's when they're going to move to their hibernaculum. And then once inside there, we move to the winter, winter stage. And from roughly, like I said, it, the, the dates can change, like September to November it can be, can be considered winter. But, and then to about March, April, May, they're going to be basically shut off for the entire season. They go into these caves and abandoned mines, and basically they're, they're, fully, hi they're fully hibernated. It's not like a bear where they can spring up if you poke it when it's sleeping and hi supposedly hibernating. These things are fully shut off. If you go into a cave and grab a bat, which I have done on surveys, it takes them a good five to 10 minutes to fully wake up and be, be able to start flying again. They're, they're, they have no idea what's going on, of course, and then they're just, uh, and it just takes them a little bit, and they just kind of work it and work it, and then all of a sudden they're mad enough, and they get going, and then you've woken them up. Um, so in a lot of these hibernaculum, uh, it's a big deal in, in conservation, conserving these hibernation sites. Uh, because they've been going there for you know probably thousands of years because they pick sites uh, specific climates and specific precipitation and humidity they they take their time and pick the right sites that they're not going to freeze to death when they're in there because the temperature is just right for them to lower their metabolism and lower their energy expenditure to try and keep warm that they're they're at a perfect temperature where it's not too cold, but it's not warm enough to where they need to wake up and go feed because they're basically relying on their, their stored fat from the fall, the summer and the fall. Um, and another way that they save energy is by clustering together. So they can, you know, some bats will just hibernate one, one bat by themselves, but other bats will, I've seen a, a cluster of larger than 50,000 bats in, in one cave, and they were all clustered together, and, and it really, I mean, not much bigger than right, you know, one of those openings right there. It was, they're so small, and when they get tightly packed in, they can fit 50,000 in a very, very small place. So um, that's, that's the big deal with, with the conservation. If we're, if we're disrupting those hibernation sites or, you know, with white nose coming through um, in the east, it, that's why it really affected because the bats out east really do uh, hibernate with large clusters. And so when white nose started to spread, it spread like wildfire in there. It just, if it hits one bat and they're, you know, on that cluster of 50,000, those 50,000 are going to be, have the fungus and probably die that winter, if not, it, and possibly the next winter. So after that. Will other species hibernate together? Uh, not, they'll, they'll, they'll hibernate in the same cave, but not really together in the same cluster. So you'll find, and that's all like what I was saying about the different climates of the cave. They have, the, you know, you go into a cave and every little room and every little part of the cave has a different climate. And so you'll find the big brown bats kind of at the entrance where it's a little warmer and, you know, they get a little bit more airflow. But then deeper down the cave, that's where you'll find the northern long-eared bats and a little bit of the smaller bats, like the tricolored bats. Those ones go deep down in there and they have, it's really cool, I wish I had a picture of it, but when they're hibernating, they have, uh, the moisture starts to wick out on their, on their fur, and they just, it looks like they have little ice crystals all, all around them, and they're just hanging out there with this condensation on them, and it's, it's quite, quite pretty, actually. The fungus, it, it was uh, supposedly started by some European cavers that came over and brought it. it was, it's a fungus that has been in Europe for, for a very long time. The wildlife there is, is accustomed to it. But they brought it over there by, you know, just the spores or something was on some of their equipment, brought it in there, and it was a perfect climate for the humidity and everything, like I said, for the bats, was also perfect for the fungus to spread. And once it got on there with them in close proximity, it just eats away at their, at their skin, basically, and it damages their wings. and. Um, I'll, yeah, 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 exactly. And that's all. And 
yeah, exactly. And the spores will be like that. And I've got a picture later when I talk about white nose, but um, yeah, it spreads like wildfire. And you know, we don't know if it's the fungus damaging them and they're waking up to actively fight it off, or or if the fungus is eating away at their fat stores and then they're like, I need to wake up and and go eat. But basically, it's waking them up in the winter and there's no bugs and they need to go replenish their their fat stores and there's no insects for them to eat and they die. So, you know, I'll jump into it right now just because we're on the, on the subject already, but when, uh, when they first found it in, I think, 2009 in, in uh, south central New York, they were doing cave surveys, which I've done for, for many years before White Nose, and it's just kind of a census that we do that for. And when they walked in, they walked into a normal cave that they'd been going to for years, and then there was hundreds, if not thousands, of bats just laying on the ground dead. And then they went to another cave and saw the same thing, and another cave, and they say, saw the same thing. And that's when it became not just an isolated incident. And then every year since, I've got a map, and I'll show you guys too, kind of just the spread of, of white nose. Um, but for now, I'll jump into the summer part. <laughs> 